Let me begin with the answer should be obvious. Maybe I even already mentioned this example once in the last five years here. Why this clip? We all know it. It's in the middle of the fourth movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It's, you know that the melody is the unofficial, but I think even half official, anthem of European Union. And I'm always again and again struck by the irony of it. This music is, at least the melody, ideology at its purest. Already in the elementary sense that it fits everyone. Like, let's go through, the Nazis loved it. Uh, communists loved it. For the Nazis it was German Volksgemeinschaft, for the communists it was international brotherhood. In World War II, Japan, I read. Japan military loved it because it has somewhere in the words the motive of joy through suffering. Now, every authentic fascist loves this. Now we go on. Do you know that during the Chinese Cultural Revolution, when all Western music, classical, was banned, prohibited, the only exception was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Yeah, progressive, unity of the people, and so on. Now let's go to the other extreme. Do you know that when in the 70s, I think, South Rhodesia, today's Zimbabwe, proclaimed independence, in, proclaimed independence with the, from England as a colony from the, because with only one goal, to retain apartheid. You know what was their national end, anthem? Yes, this melody. They just changed the words, oh, Rhodesia, happy country, and so on, but this was it. Then, if you go to Latin America, Abimael Guzman uh, of Sendero Luminoso, also said, this is his favorite piece of music, and so on, and so on. So this is ideology. You can take all today's official enemies and imagine them, you know, like uh, George Bush embracing Obama bin Laden, Putin embracing the Chechens. Oh, this is the moment when we are nonetheless all humans. We all love this. So what is then, so even in Germany, maybe you know that before full legalization of the two Germanys, legalization in the sense of admission to the United States and so on. I remember when I was young, in the 60s, even early 70s, you know that when a German athlete won the Olympic Games, this was played as instead of German East or West national anthem. So what's so interesting about it? What effectively happens? Usually people's attention focuses on this melody. The song repeated first three times orchestrally, there, then four times with four singers, chorus, and then something strange happens in the middle of the fourth movement. After this sublime climax, you have, when you, aha, you started applauding, you wanted to oppress the ordinary people. Because then, after the silence, there are some obscene sounds, which, interestingly enough, the first critics in Beethoven's time to the premiere of the symphony compared them to vulgar sounds of wind breaking, of flatulence, and so on. And then you have the obscene popular version, and I find this so sublime, with a view to the fact that Turkey was the traumatic point whose entrance, entrance was blocked by France and others to Europe, you know that that rhythm of that obscene part, the beginning of which you heard, is called Marcha Turca. So it's exactly as if Beethoven saw where we are today. All a breeder, all Europeans together, but Marcha Turca, Turks, everything goes wrong. Literally, because if you know the symphony, in one of my books, I forgot which one, I give 10 pages analysis. Uh, uh, after that, structurally, it cannot, Beethoven is not able to find balance. The first reaction of chorus to this obscene music is some 
confused, up and down singing, then some vague reference to God who is beyond. It's total, no balance. At the end, there is a kind of synthesis which is totally empty, resembling a little bit the finale of Entführung aus dem Serai and so on and so on. So I claim that this is our choice today. Either what Western, okay, conservatives want just the pure melody. Conservatives are like you when you started to applaud. Let's stop it here. Erase Marcia Turka. Liberals would like to say, let's expand. Let's invite them also to sing with us so that we all together sing this melody. But I think our conclusion should be clear. The problem is not with this obscenity which intrudes. The problem is with the melody itself. We need a new European melody. We need a new anthem. Why? Where are we? Okay. Uh, there is a wonderful expression, I hope I will pronounce it correctly, I'm not sure, in Persian. It's something like, so I was told by a Persian friend, var nam nihadan, which means, I love this, it's a condensed everyday expression, which means, if you translate it literally, to murder somebody, bury his body, then grow flowers over the body to conceal it, and then walk nervously on those flowers, nervously that someone will discover the body beneath. And this is the reality of our media, I claim. In 2011, we were witnessing and participating in a series of shattering events from the Arab Spring to the Occupy Wall Street movement, from the United Kingdom suburban protests to Breivik's ideological madness, but still ideological madness in Oslo. 2011 was thus the year of dreaming dangerously in both directions. There were emancipatory dreams mobilizing protesters all around the world, and there were the obscure, destructive dreams propelling Breivik and racial, racist populists all around Europe, from Netherlands to Hungary. The primary task of the hegemonic ideology and big media was to neutralize the true dimension of these events. That is to say, it was precisely some kind of var nam Nihadan. Let's bury the corpse and let's plant some grass on it. The media were killing the radical emancipatory potential of the events by obfuscating their threat to democracy, or they were, sorry, obfuscating their threat to democracy, and they were growing flowers over the buried corpse. This is why it is so important to set the record straight, what is eff effectively happening in Europe, but not only in Europe, from 2011 onwards. My first reaction to the events will be just no wisdom, please. Because the predominant liberal reaction, if you notice, in the media is one of wisdom. Oh, we all need illusions, it was wonderful, millions of people on Tahrir Square, but let's be realists. Did you see now Islamists, Muslim Brotherhood won the election? You see, that's the reality. It always returns not only to the same, but even to something worse, so better not to shake things too much. The result will be an even worse one. In other words, the, this vulgar wisdom is something the form of which, or the most popular expression of which would be, and for this I'm ready in a Stalin's way to say we should burn the movie, the vulgar song of one of the films that I really hate, The Lion King. You remember how uh, in the middle of the film, the young lion asks the father, but if we lions are good guys, how comes that we eat zebras? This isn't just. And then father, the king, sings the famous song, uh, 
the circle of life. Here it is. It's the circle of life and it moves us all through despair and hope, through faith and love, till we find our place on the path unwinding in the circle, the circle of life. This means, as it is further explained, true we eat zebras, but we will also die, we will rot in the earth, our rotten flesh will feel grass, will feed grass, grass will be eaten by zebras, and so on. So it's a circle of life and so on and so on. What's wrong with this wisdom? Everything. Because uh, can you imagine if your mind is dirty enough? Mine is. In, uh, otherwise, I don't like the film, but as an example, in, in Roberto Benigni's La Vita e Bella, let's say that the son notices that it's really Auschwitz killing machine and asks the father, father, why are the Nazis killing us Jews? And I would love to see Roberto Benigni starting to sing a song. Oh, my song, it's all one big circle of life. It's true that Nazis are killing us, but Nazis will also die. They will rot. Their flesh will feed grass. Grass will be eaten by cows. Uh, butchers will kill the cows, and we Jews will buy the steaks and eat them. So it's one big circle of life, and so on. So our answer, you know, this is the, the fundamental conservative, liberal conservative even, argument against shaking things. Oh, it's a revolution. They, they claim that they, they act as if they say something so deep. If they, when they point out that the original meaning predominant use of the word revolution is precisely just like planets circulating around. You move it, but the old, old order reestablishes itself and so on and so on. Our answer should be clear. Yes, of course there is a circle of life, but th the whole point is that there are different circles of life. A true revolution precisely is not an element of the circle of life, but it changes the very circle, like at social level. Maybe we can have a circle of life where it's not necessary to have the Nazis killing the Jews, no? Or maybe there is a circle of life where, uh, where I don't know, a tribal chief in Congo, 100 years ago, doesn't have to sing to his child, it's true, Belgians are killing us, but Belgians will die and we will eat the grass they will feed or whatever. So, uh, and this is important also as a political lesson. Uh, true, there is now a new circle of life, a new circular struggle in Egypt. But with all the justified pessimism and precaution, it's not the same circle of life as before. Even if nothing radical will happen at the end, we have to admit, we have now a thriving civil society there, trade unions, women, students, organizing themselves, and so on and so on. So don't fall into this uh, false wisdom of, it's not worth to shake things, and so on and so on. Okay, the second, uh, the second uh, thing that I uh, reject is, critique of corruption and critique limited to financial capitalism. Don't misunderstand me. Of course, all the criminals, bankers and others should be ruthlessly persecuted. I don't have any problems here. I'm one of the few person whom I know who is even still for death penalty. So don't misunderstand me here. I'm saying something else. Do not blame people and their attitudes. The problem is not corruption or greed. The problem is the system that pushes you or enables you to be corrupt. The solution is not, as some mild, moderate protesters were shouting in the United States, Main Street, not Wall Street, but to change the system where Main Street cannot function without Wall Street. Public figures from Pope, from Rome, downward, bombard us with injunctions to fight our culture of excessive greed and consumation. This disgusting spectacle of chief moralization is a pure ideological operation if there ever was one. The compulsion 
the compulsion to expand is inscribed into the capitalist system as such. And we should not translate it into personal sin, into a private psychological uh, propensity. No wonder that one of the theologists around Pope said, here I quote it literally, the present crisis is not the crisis of capitalism, but the crisis of morality. That's what I find really disgusting. Like, don't touch the system. This, I think, is the true stake of moralistic critics of capitalism. Uh, what is wrong here? I want to evoke a joke which probably you already know, a wonderful anecdote which has, I think, deep ideological consequences for critique of ideology. A wonderful joke from Ernst Lubitsch's classical comedy with Greta Garbo, Ninochka. The film's hero enters a cafeteria and orders coffee without cream. And the waiter gives a unique reply. The waiter says, sorry, but we have run out of cream. We only have milk, so can I bring you coffee without milk? Like, you know, like, and this is, I think, a deep Hegelian point, because if you want to understand what Hegel means when he says that negation is part of the positive identity of an object, an object is not only what it is, it's part of its identity, you have to include what, what it is not. This is why I think this joke has wonderful political consequences. For example, already immediately, with us, we didn't have such lack of, we, in Yugoslav socialism, lack of consumer obj consumerist object in stores, but a friend of Poland told me that they had exactly the same version of this joke, uh, sorry, a version of this joke related to, to socialist reality. A guy enters a store and says, is it still that you don't have toilet paper? And uh, a uh, salesperson answers, no, sorry, we are the store which doesn't have milk. The store across the street is the one which doesn't have toilet paper, and so on and so on. But uh, uh, a more serious example is, would have been precisely uh, the, uh, the, uh, the events in 1990. Uh, the dissolution of East European communist regimes. People prote who protested, dissidents, crowds, wanted freedom and democracy without corruption and exploitation. Like, this would be, we want coffee without cream. They got freedom and democracy without solidarity and justice, without milk. No, it's as if Western people are telling me, sorry, we don't have that, we can only give you this one, and so on. Likewise, the Catholic theologist, close to Pope, is carefully emphasizing that the protester, protesters should target moral injustice, greed, consumerism, without targeting capitalism. One should even congratulate the honesty of this theologist, who openly formulates the negation implied in the moralizing critique. Like, he's telling them coffee without milk. That is to say, criticize greed, but don't criticize uh, capitalism. So, again, the question today is that of the system. Bankers were always evil and so on and so on. The second thing, don't focus on financial capital. This also bothers me when the target is all too often just financial capital. You know why I'm afraid of this? Because we are then one step from some kind of proto-fascist anti-Semitic logic. If we go too far in the critique of financial capital, banks and so on, then we are one step from the idea that, which is well known from its very basis of fascism, that we should get productive, honest capitalists and workers. Corruption doesn't come from the basic labor capital relation, but from intruding Jewish bankers and so on and so on. So, again, I'm not, again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not praising corrupted bankers. All I'm saying is that the, the true question is what structural change happened in the last decades in global capitalism that financial capital 
acquire such a central role. Now, uh, the next point, even when we do celebrate protests, is uh, to celebrate them just as protests. This was already mentioned, Sretsko mentioned that Michael Hart emphasized this uh, ecstasy aspect of it. You know, it's the same story as in France today where every self-respectful right-wing politician will tell you with proud in 60 days, of course I was on barricades and so on and so on. You know that. What I'm afraid is that for most of the people who are protesting, it will become a wonderful, youthful adventure. And I can imagine, this is my evil dream, people who were protesting on Wall Street, 10 years from now, they meet in a bar for a lunch break, each have a drink, wasn't it wonderful 10 years ago? And then the phone rang from someone, sorry, my, my boss is calling me to the bank, I have to run away, and so on and so on. Don't fall into this. Reacting to the Paris protests of 1968, Jacques Lacan wrote, I quote him, what you aspire to as revolutionaries is a new master. You will get one, end of quote. This diagnostic prognostic should be rejected as a kind of a almost conservative statement, like every revolution asks for a new master. But I claim there is a grain of truth in it if we apply this Lacan statement to some of the protests. If you just protest and demand, you effectively expose yourself to the danger that you are creating the space for a new master. And we already got the first glimpses of this new master in Greece, in Italy, maybe Spain will follow, and so on and so on. As if ironically answering uh, the lack of expert programs of the protesters, the trend is now to replace politicians in the government with neutral government of depoliticized technocrats, mostly, mostly bankers. And again, the only way to fight this is to move a step further from protests. So, uh, Next thing we should oppose is a social democratic welfare state nostalgia. Let me be now very brutal, then I will be more kind the more we progress into. If you ask a figure that I will invent now, the archetypal European left liberal moron, I don't mean the word moron in, a, in an aggressive way. By moron, I mean the typical common sense wisdom. Like, you know, it's uh, Watson for Sherlock Holmes, Captain Hastings for Hercule Poirot in Agatha Christie. This type of moron, average intelligence intellectual, if you ask him what is wrong with Europe today, what will he tell you? I think something like this. First, he will no doubt begin by sharing his deep worry. The moron is worried about Europe. As a politically correct anti-racist moron, he will immediately add that, of course, he rejects the anti-immigrant populism. The danger comes from within, not from Islam. The two main threats to Europe are this very anti-immigrant populist defense of Europe and neoliberal economics. So, you know, when we say Let's save Europe from its false defenders, from Brussels technocrats and from racist anti-populists. We are still at the level of the moron. Against this double threat, the moron would propose to resuscitate social solidarity, multicultural tolerance, material conditions for cultural development, and so on and so on. What is his solution? How to do it? The main moron idea is to return to authentic welfare state. We need maybe even a new political party which will simply stick to the good old principles abandoned under the neoliberal pressure. We need to regulate banks and control financial excesses. We need to guarantee 
free universal health care and education, and so on and so on. Now you will say, so what is wrong with this attitude? Everything, I think. Such an approach is strictly idealist. It opposes to the existing deadlock its own idealized ideological supplement. Recall what Marx wrote about Plato's Republic. Its problem is not that it is too utopian, but on the contrary, that it remains the ideal image of the existing politico-economic order. And mutatis mutandis, one should read the ongoing dismantling of the welfare state, not as a betrayal of this noble idea, but as a failure which retroactively enables us to discern a fatal flaw in the very notion of welfare state. The lesson is that if, thus, if we want to save the emancipatory kernel of the notion of welfare state, uh, universal material conditions for freedom like healthcare, free education and so on, we should change the terrain and move over its basic implications, like the long-term viability of a social market economy, that is to say, of a socially responsible capitalism. I think that if we don't do this step, if we remain within the horizon of how to change just some things to still combine capitalism with welfare state, we are just contributing to the process which we try to reverse. What are then further traps here? Michael Hart's and Tony Negri's analysis, which I share up to a certain point, underestimates, I think, the extent to which today's capitalism successfully, in short term at least, privatized common knowledge itself. This is, I think, again, I already repeated this last year, I, I know one of the crucial things happening today. You remember how in Grundrisse fragment, Marx dreams about a society which is basically already here today for us, where the main source of wealth will no longer be work, labor, measured by time, but social knowledge embodied in science, in material practices, culture, and so on. And the idea of Marx is that once this happens, capitalism is over, because capitalism is based on exploitation. Exploitation is, uh, uh, the, is the appropriation of, of, uh, of surplus value, which is based on uh, time as the labor time as source of value, and so on. What Marx wasn't able to imagine is how, even if we have common knowledge, this, let's call it collective cognitive capital, as the main source of wealth, it can also be privatized. Uh, so, uh, this they don't see. Another thing that I think they, Hart and Negri, don't uh, emphasize enough is the extent to which not only, as Negri likes to emphasize, bourgeoisie is becoming purely parasitical, no longer playing a necessary structural role in social production, but workers themselves are more and more, in our Western societies, of course, mostly, becoming superfluous. Larger and larger numbers of them are turning into not just temporarily unemployed, but structurally unemployable workers. Furthermore, now I want to pursue in another direction. Even if it is in principle true that bourgeoisie is progressively becoming non-functional, one should qualify this statement. Non-functional for whom? For capitalism itself. That is to say, if the old capitalism ideally involved an entrepreneur who invested his own or borrowed money into production, organized and run by himself, reaping the profit, a new ideal type is emerging today. No longer the entrepreneur who owns his company, but the expert manager or a managerial board presided by a CEO 
who runs a company owned by banks, also run by managers who don't own the bank, or by dispersed investors. In this new ideal type of capitalism, without bourgeoisie in the classical sense, the old bourgeoisie rendered non-functional is refunctionalized as salaried managers. The new bourgeoisie itself gets wages, wages. And even if they own part of their company, they earn stocks as part of the remuneration for their work, bonuses for their successful management, and so on and so on. This new bourgeoisie still appropriates surplus value, but in the mystified form of what Jean-Claude Milner calls surplus wage. In general, they are paid more than the proletarian minimal wage. Uh, this minimal wage is the point of reference whose real example would have been in today's global economy, the salary of a worker in a sweatshop in China or Indonesia and so on. And it is this difference from common proletarians, this distinction, which determines their status of the new bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie, in the classic sense, thus tends to disappear. Capitalists reappear as a subset of salaried workers, managers who are qualified to earn more by their competence, which of course, which is why pseudo-scientific evaluation, which legitimizes experts to earn more, is crucial today. This category of workers earning a surplus wage is, of course, not limited to managers. It is extended to all sorts of experts, administrators, public servants, doctors, lawyers, journalists, intellectuals, artists, in short, people like us here in this room. The surplus they get has two forms, more money for managers and so on, but also less work. That is to say, more free time for some intellectuals, but also for parts of state administration. Therein resides, I think, for example, the deadlock of today's China. The ideal goal of Deng Xiaoping's reforms was to introduce capitalism without bourgeoisie as the new ruling class. Now, however, Chinese leaders are making the painful discovery of how capitalism without stable hierarchy, brought by bourgeoisie as a new class, generates permanent instability. So what path will China take more generally? This is also arguably the reason why ex-communists are re-emerging as the most efficient managers of capitalism. Their historical enmity against bourgeoisie as a class fits perfectly the tendency of today's capitali capitalism towards a managerial capitalism without the classical bourgeoisie. In both cases, as Stalin put it long ago, cadre, cadres decide everything. In this sense, I think Stalinism was really ahead of time. Do you know that in, in the 30s, for example, uh, the new class of communist managers was incredibly privileged as a salaried bourgeoisie. Like, without shame, they admitted that in a new Soviet factory, the manager got like two, three hundred times the salary of the ordinary uh, worker. There is also an interesting difference emerging here between today's China and Russia. For example, what is the status of university cadres, intellectuals? In Russia, they are not included into the new salaried bourgeoisie. They are paid like dogs, nothing. They all have to translate more and so on. Chinese are here more intelligent. They pay them very well. So well, as a matter of fact, that thousands of university professors already moved from Taiwan to China, to mainland China. This is also the way to control them. Uh, furthermore, now I come to my pessimist conclusion. This notion of surplus wage also allows us to throw a new light on the ongoing anti-capitalist protests. 
on one aspect of them. I fully support them otherwise. In times of crisis, the obvious candidate for tightening the belt are the lower levels of this salaried bourgeoisie. Since their surplus wages play a no imminent economic role, the only thing that stands in the way of their joining the proletarians is their political protest. And here I have a problem. Uh, in many countries around Europe, while I in principle always support strikes, of course, but I must say frankly, although some of you may find this problematic, that it makes me set the extent to which precisely this category of privileged salaried bourgeoisie state employees manage and so on lower managers and so on intellectuals uh, they are the ones who still dare to strike the zero level proletarians they don't dare to strike they're happy to retain their job even if it's a minimal salary and so on and i claim that many of the strikes going on today are effectively the strikes of this salaried bourgeoisie they Unfortunately, that was my impression. This will sound horrible, maybe, for some of my friends, about the much celebrated general strike in Slovenia, one day strike a couple of weeks ago. Of course, I support it in principle. But my problem is that this was clearly, predominantly, the strike of the privileged, salaried bourgeoisie, professors, uh, policemen, and so on, intellectuals, and so on, precisely the strata which still, till now, enjoyed a certain safety, uh, long-term employment, less work, and so on. It was literally, predominantly, I claim, a strike not in solidarity with workers, but a strike whose implicit, at least, goal was precisely to maintain the distance, not to join the, not to join the, uh, the proletarians. So we are again in a very paradoxical situation where this salaried bourgeoisie is uh, the only one which still dares almost, which still dares to strike. Which is why I think it is absolutely crucial to invent, develop some kind of solidarity of this new form of salaried bourgeoisie with ordinary proletarians, whatever you call them. Without this, the prospect is uh, very sad. So, to go back to my main line, the key feature that we should emphasize about today's society is that the ongoing crisis is not about reckless spending, greed, ineffectual bank regulations, and so on. I claim that something much more radical is happening. An economic cycle is coming to an end. A cycle which began in the early 1970s. The time, what? The Greek economist who I appreciate pretty much, Yanis Vakoufakis, sorry, Varoufakis, uh, calls the global minotaur. This global minotaur was born. The monstrous engine that was running the world economy from the early 1980s till 2008. That is to say, the late 1960s and the early 1970s were not just the times of oil crisis and stagflation. President Richard Nixon's decision to abandon the gold standard for the US dollar was the sign of a much more radical shift in the basic functioning of the entire capitalist system. By the end of the 1960s, the American economy was no longer able to continue the recycling of its surpluses to Europe and Asia. Its surpluses has turned into deficits. Then, in 1971, the US government responded to this decline with an audacious and, I claim, quite ingenious strategic move. Instead of tackling the nation's burgeoning deficit, the US government decided to do the exact opposite, to boost deficits. And, I quote here Varoufakis, who would pay for them the rest of the world? 
how, by means of a permanent transfer of capital, the trust ceaselessly across the two great oceans to finance America's deficits. These deficits thus started to operate, a long quote now from Varoufakis, like a giant vacuum cleaner, absorbing other people's surplus goods and capital. While that arrangement was the embodiment of the grossest imbalance imagined at a planetary scale, nonetheless it did give rise to something resembling global balance, an international system of rapidly accelerating asymmetrical financial and trade flows capable of putting on a semblance of stability and steady growth. Powered by these deficits, the world's leading surplus economies, Germany, Japan, and later China, kept churning out the goods while America absorbed them. Almost 70% of the profits made globally by these countries were then transferred back to the United States in the form of capital flows to Wall Street. And what did Wall Street do with it? It turned this capital inflows into direct investments, shares, and so on, and so on, end of quote. Although Emmanuel Todes, the French uh, social economic theor theoretician, vision of today's global order is maybe too one-sided, it is difficult to deny its moment of truth, that the United States are in an empire in decline. Its growing negative trade balance demonstrates that the United States is the non-productive predator. It has to suck up $1 billion daily influx from other nations to buy for its consumption. And it's as such the universal Keynesian consumer that keeps the world economy running. This influx, which is effectively, uh, which uh, is effectively like uh, money paid to Rome in antiquity, or the gifts sacrificed to Minotaur by ancient Greeks, this uh, influx relies on a complex economic mechanism. The US is, a trust, is trusted as the safe and stable center so that all others, from the oil-producing Arab countries to Western Europe, Japan, even Chinese, invest their surplus profits into the United States. Since this trust is primarily ideological and military, not economic, the problem for the United States is how to justify its imperial role. It needs a permanent state of war so that it had to invent the war on terror, offering itself as the universal protector of all other normal, not rogue states. The entire globe thus tends to function as the universal Sparta with its three classes, now emerging as the first, second, and third world. United States as the military, political, ideological power, Europe and parts of Asia and Latin America as the industrial manufacturing region and the underdeveloped rest, today's helots. In other words, global capitalism brought about a new general trend to oligarchy uh, masked as the celebration of the diversity of cultures. And again, my point is that this model is today falling apart. This totally perverse, we even didn't notice how perverse it was, structural imbalance, where literally everything turned around, the key moment was literally at least one billion per day deficit of the United States. It no longer works, this model and capitalism is desperately looking for a way out, and I think this is the background of the crisis. If uh, 50 years ago we like to say that, uh, 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 that you, uh, the world needed United States. Now, uh, the United States needs the world. You know, it was very popular when I was young, this cynical reasoning. I remember an essay was written, what were to happen in 1960s if the whole India 
were to be submerged into the ocean? The answer was nothing, minor disturbance. I claim that if the whole of the United States were to submerge into the ocean, something similar holds today for the, more or less, for the United States. So, again, we have reactions. I enumerated them at the beginning, reactions to this crisis. How are we to judge these reactions? What is happening today? What does it mean? Tahrir Square, Occupy Wall Street, all the protests. Here I will propose a somewhat poetic, theological even version, but I stick to it very literally. In his arcades project, Walter Benjamin quotes the French historian André Monglon. Here is the quote. The past has left images of itself in literary texts, images comparable to those which are imprinted by lights on a photosensitive plate. The future alone possesses developers active enough to scan such surface perfectly. You know, the idea is a beautiful one that we get literally in art signs from the future. We have fragments in art which are simply not readable in their own time. It's only from the future that you can retroactively read them. Like a classical example, which I think even repeated here years ago, uh, uh, to read properly, Kafka is such a heroic figure. We can only read properly today Dostoevsky, William Blake, Edgar Allan Poe backwards from Kafka. Kafka was the developer rendering them, even John Middleton, rendering them readable. I think that events like Occupy Wall Street protests, the Arab Spring, demonstrations in Greece and Spain and so on, have to be read precisely as such signs from the future. We should turn around the usual historicist perspective of understanding an event out of its context and genesis. Radical emancipatory outbursts cannot be understood in this way. Instead of analyzing them as part of the continuous development from past to present, we should bring in the perspective of the future. We should analyze them as limited, distorted, sometimes even perverted, fragments of a utopian future which lies dormant in the present as its hidden potential. According to Gilles Deleuze in Marcel Proust, I quote Deleuze, people and things occupy a place in time which is incommensurable with the one that they have in space, end of quote. For example, the notorious Madeleine from the beginning of Proust's masterpiece is here in place, but this is not its true time. In a similar way, one should learn the art to recognize from an engaged subjective position elements which are here in our space, but whose time is the emancipated future, the future of the communist idea. This is, I will pursue now even further, up to the utmost point of madness, this theological dimension. Because why? In what sense? Uh, of course, things are here much more complex. I am not saying, this is crucial, there is a fixed communist future and we are already getting signs from it. No, this future is purely virtual. There will be or maybe there will not be this future. But the paradox is that we have this circular structure. Only by reading what we do now as signs of the future, from our engaged position, can we maybe bring about this future? Let me give you, quote to you, a wonderful science fiction story about time travel, which renders perfectly the structure I try to describe. Uh, it's an old, I forgot even the title, who is on, time, uh, time travel story which takes place in New York in 25th century, where they already developed some kind of primitive time travel machine. So an art historian from 25th century is fascinated by a painter from mid uh, 20th century, painter vaguely 
modeled on Jackson Pollock. So he said, my God, I would like to be there to write the real biography of this Pollock. So he takes the time travel machine and moves to New York in mid forties. What he discovers there, just before the career of this painter started, what he discovers there is a nightmare. That this painter is a totally stupid, vulgar drunkard who is not only without any talent, but even evil. When this historian introduces himself to this painter, the painter steals the machine from him and escapes into the future. Now, if you like science fiction paradoxes then, and know them, you must have already guessed what happens then. Stuck in this time, the critic from the future, what can he do? He adopts the identity of the painter and paints the very paintings which made the painter famous in the future. It's a nice circular structure. There is something uh, like this that we should emphasize. Let me go even deeper in, uh, in, uh, in uh, teleology here. Uh, Blaise Pascal, his idea of uh, Deus absconditus, le Dieu caché, the hidden God, there were already many Marxists, not only Lucien Goldman and Alain Badiou, who recognized the proto-communist dimension of Pascal there. You know what is Pascal's idea? That God doesn't want to reveal himself fully. If God were to reveal himself fully, then everybody would be simply convinced, my God, if you see clearly him, haha, who would doubt, you know. But he says that's not good. It cannot be done. It's not bad for faith, for authentic faith. But God also cannot be completely hidden. If it's completely hidden, then nothing. Then skeptics or as Pascal calls them libertines, which you should be very careful here. It's a wonderful semantic shift. In the, six, in the 17th century, libertin didn't mean what you probably dream about, uh, sexual debauchery and so on. It means atheist, skeptical, free thinker. And in 100 years, the meaning changed totally. It meant what you all like to dream about and so on. So, okay. Uh, Pascal says this also not. So here comes Pascal's wonderful dialectical idea of a hidden God who sends signs. And as Pascal points out, these signs are uh, miracles. But here is the beauty of Pascal. He says these miracles, precisely therein resides the divine wisdom. These miracles are miracles only for those who search for them and who want to recognize them as miracles. They are not miracles out there for everyone. Something happens which is a miracle. If you are an ordinary libertin skeptic, you will say, oh, this is just some freakish accident of nature. Only as a believer, you will recognize it as a miracle. Uh, what does this mean? It means Pascal is here a proto-Marxist. It means theory of communism is not an objective social theory. It's a theory which is true, but you have access to this truth only from an engaged subjective position. It's not simply that you don't care about workers, but you study history and you will see, oh my God, it looks that workers will win in the long term, so let's, let's jump on their car or whatever. No, it's only from an engaged position uh, that you get it. Which is why, as Pascal put it wonderfully, there is a circular reaction between the teaching, the doctrine, and miracle. Mi a doctrine is just abstract theory. It needs a miracle, which means some impossible traumatic event which shapes you. But miracle also needs a doctrine to be recognized at what it is. There is no external objective measure. We have to accept this circle. I claim, to put it in a slightly naive way, I claim that uh, this is where we are today. If the 20th century communism, at least in its Stalinist version, was still the communism of revealed religion, you know, like neo-Thomists, they claim everyone who honestly thinks can recognize God 
the truth is out there. Our communism should maybe be, I love this term, not Deus absconditus, but communism absconditus, because they put it hidden. You are able to read its traces only from an engaged position. And we can precisely replace the Pascal's opposition between authentic believer and the, what he called libertin with today's terms. Libertin is a liberal skeptic. Oh, don't have any illusions. It's just a freak of history. People are dreaming. Like, how would they react to Tahrir Square? A libertin would say, it's interesting, a revolt, okay. Uh, Mubarak screwed them a little bit, but who knows? Now you see the result. Don't take it too seriously. People are dreaming. Reality reasserts itself. If you speak from a subjectively engaged position of looking for or fidelity to communism, you are able to read, for example, but not only Tahrir Square, Occupy Wall Street, as what they were, as don't be afraid, I'm a total atheist, but I think we should rehabilitate the atheist notion of a miracle. Wasn't Tahrir Square, in some sense, of course, not metaphysical, a miracle? Absolutely no one expected it. We in the West were racist who thought stupid Arabs, the only way to mobilize them is anti-Semitism, nationalism, and, uh, uh, and religious fundamentalism. A miracle happened. Some, not of course, really, a, a miracle in the sense of something unexpected. Again, Occupy Wall Street, another miracle. Miracles happen. You need an engaged position to recognize them. Again, let's not misunderstand me. I'm not saying there is a secret God up there who is, or even the communist version of God, a uh, uh, historical necessity which is sending us miracles. No, this necessity is the subjective need, the subjective urge. It's the miracle in the sense of recognizing potentials, traces from the future here and now. They are readable only from an engaged, uh, uh, engaged position. So, uh, uh, let me conclude now with three points. The first one, I will now, I would like now to give you uh, one, just one or two examples of such a miracle. Of course, there are the political miracles. And I hope you find how this is intuitively true. If you analyze Tahrir Square, for example, just as a sociological phenomenon, you get stuck in this bullshit. Yes, primitive Egyptian masses, a brief moment of illusion, and so on and so on. No, you should see the miracle from the future in it, and so on and so on. But I would like to give you two different examples to shock you a little bit. Uh, you know, we often hear that the communist vision is maybe good, interesting, but that it relies on dangerous idealization of human beings. It attributes to humans a kind of natural goodness which is simply alien to real people. My God, we have a miracle here. A wonderful, it's a very modest, naive thing that I will report to you now, but it's wonderful. Daniel Pink wrote a book called Drive. And he, in this book, refers to a whole body of behavioral scientific research which suggests that sometimes at least external incentives, financial reward, can even be counterproductive. That is to say, let me simplify it and so that I don't lose too much time, yes, shorten it up a little bit. Uh, the experiment was this one. They did to a group of people different level tasks. First, there were low-level tasks, mechanical work, and they gave them different amounts of financial reward. If there was a non-creative primitive work, they discovered the obvious thing. The more you are paid, the more you were efficient. But when tasks became minimally creative, intellectually challenging, they discovered something beautiful. 
even if it's naive and it's immediately exploited by capitalists, they discover not only that above a certain level, money doesn't matter, but even that above a certain level, money is counterproductive. It's incredibly beautiful. If you have a group of people and tell them, here we have a tough nut to break, to break, creative one about how to reconstruct cyberspace in this way, whatever. If you give them too much money, they will do much worse than if you, you give them no money. Then they did this scientists something, uh, ah, to uh, dispel one misunderstanding. Now you will say this must have been some crazy lunatic leftist scientists. Yes, they were, because uh, the institution which organized this uh, uh, was, uh, was the notorious left wing, left wing, left, leftist group called the Federal Reserve Bank of United States did this. So, okay, they went on and they said, wait a minute, maybe this is a cultural specificity, people having a relatively high standard of living in United States. So they did a wonderful, honest, simple thing. They went to Africa, Mali or where, poor Africa. They went to India, to a village, repeated exactly the same experiment, of course, with lower sums of money. And they obtained always the same result. You got the result. It's not only that money doesn't matter after a certain point, that it's even counterproductive. If you have a creative task, and if you are somewhat, somehow aware that the better you do it, more you will be paid. If money is too high, it's counterproductive. You do it worse. Why I like this example? I know it's A, totally naive. B, I know how postmodern capitalism likes these examples to screw workers better. You know, this is the whole Google, Microsoft propaganda. We give you a creative environment where money doesn't matter and, and all that stuff and so on and so on. So, of course, we should know well what is going on here. That this holds for these top companies, Microsoft, Google, Apple, but then, you know what's the other side of Apple? You know, I think that if I were to live in a dictatorship where I would be a dictator, who doesn't have this dream? One of the irrational rules I would impose is that whenever the mention Apple as the label is mentioned, I would say Apple slash Foxconn. You know who is Foxconn? The truth of Apple. Literally over a million workers in Shanghai suburbs and elsewhere working under the most terrifying conditions, and typically for today's China, the obscenity is open and direct. For example, it's incredible what is happening today. The director of Foxconn visited Shanghai and demanded to meet the boss of Shanghai Zoo, Zoological Garden. When asked why, he said, well, we have similar problems. My problem is how to run in a disciplined way one million animals. And I hope to learn something from zoological garden, how they do it there, you know. And the story of Foxconn is wonderful. You have their human capitalism at its best. You know when they had those massive suicides? You know what Foxconn did? Every worker with Foxconn has to uh, sign an anti-suicidal pact. Well, he promises that he will not kill himself, and he promises, much nicer, that if he sees some of his colleagues in, uh, too depressed, that he will uh, denounce them. Plus, I found this wonderful, uh, suicides are made by jumping from high-rise buildings because they work in small, multi-store buildings. Foxconn put networks around the buildings. This is humanism, so that if you... Okay, but what, what I say is that in spite of this, and of the, in spite of all the naivety of this experiment, isn't there nonetheless something beautiful here? Isn't it at least very naively 
a kind of empirical confirmation that no, capitalist egotism is not our danger. We are not dreaming. It's not true that at a certain level you can organize production so that not only it's not conditioned the quality by finances, but financial aspect, if it's too much underlined, emphasized, it's even counterproductive. I mean, we may laugh about that Marxist idea of definition of communism, you know, to each to his needs, each gives to his abilities. But sorry, isn't this exactly the formula of this? Once you give people each to his needs, that he doesn't have to give money, he will work according to his abilities. I think this is, again, a wonderful, modest sign of the future. How they are even empirically false. Those who claim, oh, you communists are dreaming, and so on, and so on. No, uh, egotism is not a thing of nature. In a perverted way, even Rousseau knew this. He knew that capitalism is not even really egotist. It's envy, resentment, you know. The point of capitalism is not, I want to win. It's, you must lose, which is much more important. Okay, that's another story. Now, let me give you, to conclude on a lighter note, but with what I think we all love, and this is also an incitation to you to watch TV series. Because as we all know, now I speak as a Hegelian, Weltgeist has moved recently from Hollywood to TV series. The really creative, even commercially creative, popular culture comes much more from today, some of them, HBO and so on, TV series than from movies. Movies are getting precisely to compete with more interesting TV narratives. They are just getting more and more stupid in a spectacular way, like Avengers and so on. All these ultra battles and so on, they just mask a total lack. They are not even able to construct an interesting narrative that would have functioned on its own. Okay, so a good friend of mine, an American theologist, very leftist one. He would have been an American version of your own Boris Gunievich here, who is a friend of mine. Adam Kotsko, he wrote a wonderful book, Why We Love Sociopaths. He noticed something that precisely in the domain of TV series, almost all, almost not, but nonetheless, the, predomin the, the predominant heroes are sociopaths. For example, monsters like killing gangsters like Tony Soprano, serial killers like Dexter, torturing anti-terrorist agents like Jack Bauer, up to primitive dysfunctional fathers like Homer Simpson, and so on and so on. We obviously seem to love sociopaths. What unites all these figures is that, for whatever reason, from simple subjective satisfaction or material profit up to protecting the basic fabric of our society, these heroes are able, without any moral qualms, to suspend the basic rules of human concern and decency. They cheat, kill, torture, manipulate, humiliate others, and so on, their neighbors, without constraint. How are we to interpret this weird fascination? The obvious answer would have been to read it as an index of the decay of our social link, what holds our societies together. Our societies obviously need sociopaths if they are to function normally. Only sociopaths can save us. Society's rule have to be broken for the sake of society itself. However, Adam Kotzko proposes a perspicuous analysis where he makes a crucial step further. The problem with these sociopaths is that they are not sociopathic enough. They still need society and in their own way they serve society. In other words, what Jacques Lacan calls the big other remains operative. Namely, the goals that motivate this 
sociopaths are still socially acceptable goals. Material suspect, social, uh, social, uh, social recognition, or even patriotic goals like Jack Bauer, uh, saving one's country, and so on and so on. Uh, uh, and it also, society also easily incorporates the outcome of their activity. For example, I claim that the most perfidious pathological sociopath is Dr. House, I claim, who breaks all the rules precisely to save people and so on and so on. From this basic dialectical insight, Kotsko outlines the idea of a true. She says, he says wonderfully, it's not just that these sociopaths are pathological figures. They are because they are not sociopathic enough. We need finally a true sociopath. A social revolutionary who effectively is able to question the basic coordinates of our social substance. Then Kotsko enumerates the redeeming feature of every main type of a sociopath in series. He classifies sociopaths in three, four types. First are the schemers, like Homer, like, uh, like uh, Homer Simpson. You know, simply a stupid, dumb, father who enjoys uh, humiliating his neighbors, winning them over. What do you mean? I'm a, I know my son knows this for five years. He calls me Homer for three years. I know. Okay. But what you said, but as Kotzko notices, there is a wonderful redeeming feature. You remember when it seems that Homer will succeed in his primitive plot, uh, plot. He has, he displays a kind of a such wonderful innocent child, childlike joy. Ha <laughs> ha, I screwed him up and so on. This is a redeeming feature. Then <laughs> we have the next type of sociopathy, schemers, people who plot ruthlessly up to murder or whatever, or mostly financial cheating to succeed. They nonetheless, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, not schemers, no, they, they are climbers, yes. They display nonetheless an exceptional creativity and willingness to take risks in the ruthless pursuit of their goals. Then we have the most ominous figure of sociopaths enforcers like Jack Bauer, up to a point even McNulty from The Wire. Uh, they, their redeeming feature is that they are dedicated to a goal more important than their normal life with its pursuit of happiness. And now to conclude, I want to do something very Stalinist. From these features, I want to construct as a sign of the future, you know what Stalinists were looking for, a model of a future man that we can read. And I claim that if we combine these three redeeming features, we get maybe the type of a person that we need in our struggle for justice and solidarity. A person who shares something with Jack Bauer and so on, which is simply his or her dedication to a task larger than his life. This person doesn't like the first preamble of Declaration of Independence. No, the goal of our life is not the pursuit of happiness. It's something larger, for which we should even be ready, if necessary, to risk our life. Second thing, it should definitely share with climbers exceptional creativity and willingness to take risks. And the third feature, absolutely, we should be in our struggles like, like Homer Simpson, not this masochist revolutionaries. Oh my God, I had to forsake my, my family life for the, for the noble cause of revolution. No, we should have this childish joy. Ha ha, we screwed them up and so on. We should rediscover this childish, innocent joy of doing our task well. So when they asked Stalin in 19... 2029, in a famous interview, what is the ideal Bolshevik? 
His answer was the ideal Bolshevik, very interesting answer, is a combination of Russian obsession, dedication, and American pragmatic practical spirit. Maybe our answer today should be a true fighter for emancipation should combine the dedication to a higher cause of Jack Bauer, the, the uh, exceptional creativity and willingness to take risks of brutal social climbers and the innocent joy of Homer Soprano. You bring these three together, you have a sign for a future for what kind of a person we should be looking for. Thank you very much for your attention.